aren't they? There's been a solid 20 minutes being made up. All right, we're recording. Okay, good deal. Okay, tonight we're going to talk about the Locasana, and that's um, that was one of the first poems that really caught my attention with regards to what it represents, what it means, and how it ties into who we deal with today, their mindset, and um, dare I say ego. A lot of people get uh, very butthurt when I say ego, but ego is that idea that people create about themselves. And, and in this digital age, whether or not they do something to develop um, an image of themselves, whether they actually get out there and do the hard work, or if they actually get out there and, and achieve something great, uh, may not necessarily be the case with most of the people that we deal with on these, in, on these boards sometimes with Austria, many, more often than not, uh, the quality of who and what they are is determined by what ancient book they've read, what opinion they hold, and whether or not their friends, all 12 of them, um, reinforce that idea. So we have a, a situation where an ego or a thought about who we are, the, that image that we carry of ourselves in our minds, might get entirely out of whack. <laughs> and the, uh, a lot of people want to argue with that. But I've got a lot of scientific evidence uh, ideas, some of the top minds of, uh, of the entire field will tell you that the ego is the, is the one of the most corrupting influences in an individual's life, that perception of who we think we are. And there are very few ideas that are reinforced in the lore quite as strongly as that one. Now, the lore is multifaceted. You can peel that thing away like an onion and there's a new layer under every one of them for as long as you live. <coughs> Excuse me. When I wrote Hell, I came up with the idea that uh, Loki is also a representation of the Pope. And as we go through this, I'll, I'll get into how he is each and what that really looks like, how we might use that to become something more how we might identify it within ourselves, what it looks like when it's in full swing. And hopefully we can step away from some of the uh, Marvel Comics kind of ideology or some of the uh, knee-jerk reaction that everyone seems to give when you say something negative about that. Uh, everyone wants to say, well, he, he provides balance. He's the chaos. He's the, he's the balancing influence of our, of our faith. He's the... He's, or they'll say, well, this is not the Christian devil. No, you're right, it's not. It is the uninspired human intellect in full swing. And as we go through this, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do my I'm gonna to go to great lengths tonight to try to explain what that looks like. To really get into the locusana and what it represents and what it means. You start with the Gilfaganing. <laughs> as I will right now. Vince Beck Gangleri. Have any more matters of note befallen among the Aesir? A very great, a very great deed of valor did Thor achieve on that journey. Har made answer, which means High made the answer. Now shall be told of those tidings which seem to be of more consequence to the Aesir. The beginning of the story is this, that Balder the Good dreamed great and perilous dreams touching his life. So there's a sense of foreboding amongst this um, brightest, this solar deity. He's got concerns about his future. Um, every, the sun sets every night, so there's kind of an interesting thing going on there. <laughs> when he told these dreams to the Aesir, they took counsel together, and this was their decision, to ask safety for Balder from all kinds of dangers. And Frigg took oaths to this purport, that fire and water should spare Balder, likewise iron and metal of all kinds, stones, earth, trees, sicknesses, beasts, birds, venoms, serpents. And then when that was done and made known, then it was a diversion of Baldur's and the Aesir that he should stand up in the thing and all others should, should some shoot at him, some hew at him, and some beat him with stones. But whatsoever was done hurt him not at all. And that seemed to them all a very worshipful thing. It's an interesting term there that it was a worshipful thing that all of these activities might be undertaken and no damage would be brought or no harm to be, would be brought to bear on this son of Odin and Frigga. 
they call it a worshipful thing. <laughs> if you look at the, in just that instance, if you look at young men in the middle of, in, in the middle of their antics with other young men, they're going to do stupid stuff. I mean, that whole series of Jackass was all about these dudes doing the dumbest things they could think of. This is kind of a representation of that. All of these guys, look, I'm impervious. Come on, take a shot, blah, blah, blah. You can get this image of an immature um, spirituality, of an immature masculine identity kind of going at that, kind of saying, I'm impervious. I cannot be harmed. All young men have to deal with that. All young men go through this stage of their lives where they think, he can't, you know, he can't hurt me. I'm going to win, blah, blah, blah. And there's always somebody that resents that. There's always somebody who sees a person on the top and they don't like it. And they will take a shot at him. So when Loki Lauf Lauferson saw this, it pleased him ill that Balder took no hurt. So already here's a guy that's got an issue with this whole setup. He went to Fenselir to Frigg and made himself into the likeness of a woman. Whenever you have to change the image of who you are to do damage to someone else, it's a pretty clear sign, a pretty good indication that you're on the wrong path. That whatever comes of it's not going to come out well for you. If we have to change the thought processes of who we are in order to be accepted or to be seen as approved of by others, if we're going to change who we are, what we're going to read, what we're going to talk about, so that someone else might say, oh, yeah, well, he's, he's focused enough. He, we'll listen to him. You know, he buys into our fantasy enough that we'll allow it. You're, you're missing the point. Then Frigg asked if that woman knew what the Aesir did at the thing. She said that all were shooting at Balder, and moreover, that he took no hurt. Then said Frigg, Neither weapons nor trees may hurt, Balder. I have taken oaths of them all. Then the woman asked, Have all things taken oaths to spare Balder? And Frigg answered, There grows a tree sprout alone westward of Valhall. It is called mistletoe. And I thought it too young to ask the oath of. Then straight away the woman turned away. But Loki took mistletoe and pulled it up and went to the thing. <coughs> In all of the great stories where a mother goes to extreme lengths to protect her son from harm. Um, there's always a weakness left. The most famous is the Achilles heel. But in the tale of Groa, I believe there's another one, and we'll get to that later on in this, in this series. The mother can do a number of things for the son. From when he's young, she can raise him, feed him, love him, care for him, give him instruction, tell him to pay attention to his father. She can do all kinds of things, but to make him impervious as a man is never the realm of the feminine. That kind of masculinity is always conferred by other men. That ability to be successful as a man comes from interaction with other men. When the father isn't there saying, you need to wear tall boots to make sure you don't get struck in the Achilles heel, that's something that's kind of important. Hoder stood outside the ring of men because he was blind. So here we have an individual, and this is, this is kind of where I get the idea that Loki is also a representation of the Pope. But Loki is also the representation of that ego, the individual that can't do something for himself, so he stirs the pot enough and gets all these other people fired up so that they can do it for him. As the church you have this individual who preaches to the disenfranchised, the disassociated with, the people who are at the edge of the crowd, the broken, the crippled, the cast out, the prostitute, all of these people that stand at the edges of the crowd and are not a part of the society that revolves around what happens under the sun every day. Those people at the edges of the crowd are who Christianity preached to first. But even in, in this fringe element of society, such as we find ourselves, there are always men who are whispering those things that are encouraging us to go just a little bit further down the path. We may not necessarily want to change into a woman to be accepted further down that path. 
And I'll tell you that when you begin to buy into these ideas that people are whispering into our ears about who we need to hate, what kind of idea we need to listen to, what old book we need to read, what 19th century academic we need to study, <laughs> or the opposite of that with regards to universalists, there's no limit to what these men will ask you to sacrifice so that you will buy into their fantasy more to gain more acceptance. Hoder is the blind man standing at the edge of the edge of the crowd. And many people that show up on also true may feel that very same way. They're standing at the edge of the crowd, watching the world go by. People are enjoying success. People are living great lives. People might be believing whatever great lie they think they understand. And yet we still see these individuals have happy homes. We still see successful children come from these homes. We still see all of these things happening. And here we are at the edge of the crowd. We don't know why, but we can't take part of that. I don't understand how to operate in all that. And this is the, this is the prime breeding ground for the building of ego. Those 19th century books that everyone's so fond of reading come from the same type of disassociated academics that we make fun of today. If you go to a university and you hear someone talking about giving a TED talk about this, that, or the other, and we make fun of the ridiculousness that they're talking about, we have to bear in mind that when those men were writing those books in the 19th century, they also were fighting a tide of conservatism. They were talking about ideas that purported the, they were talking about PC or non-PC ideals in the halls of academia and other students that stood at the edge of the crowd, edge of the society, edges of the houses of royalty bought into because they could not function in those houses of royalty. There's a huge dynamic going on here. Most people don't even want to begin to accept, understand, or believe. But it's right here. Then spake Loki to him, why dost thou not shoot at Balder? Why aren't you a part of the regular world? Why aren't you enjoying success? Tell me the number of individuals you know who are personally enjoying successful lives at every level because they're following these principles of Ostatru. Well, maybe if you bought into this red pill or black pill idea and figure out who we might really blame, well, then you might get to enjoy some of that success. Then you'll really know. Then you'll really know the truth of the matter as to why you can't move forward because this group over here is controlling everything or this group over here is hating or this group over here is playing the victim better than we can because, well, we really know the truth and the ego is being built and brought out of proportion and growing and growing and we haven't done anything yet except think about it. This is the problem. He answered, because I see not where Balder is, and for this also that I am weaponless. Maybe we don't see where also true really needs to be either. Maybe we're still stuck reading the radical literature of 19th century because we feel like what we would ostracize today, it might be more legitimate. It might offer that opening that give us that formal understanding. Maybe we'll be able to see the center of what our goal with this spirituality might be if we pay more attention to what's being whispered in our ear and these ideas we're being about ourselves that we're being asked to sacrifice. Maybe we'll get that clarity of thought. Maybe the more radical we become, well, then maybe we'll get to see this all of these happenings under this great solar deity that happen every day that we're not a part of. So even in that little bit right there, there's something really strong happening. And it is, I can write two or three books about the whole thing. Then said Loki, well, in the second sense, if you look at it as Loki as the Pope, as Snorri writing this, this great trestis on the dangers of the church, <coughs> you have this Christian ideal coming in in the form of Loki as the Pope saying, you're not going to find a way there. Come with me over here. You're not going to be a part of that because there's nothing good there. Take a shot at it and let's steal the light from the world. 
Do thou also after the manner of other men and show balder honor as other men do. So he lies to him. It's an outright lie. Now, how many outright lies do we see going on within these ranks and these halls of also truth? More often than not, it's portrayed as a half truth. And there's nothing more dangerous in the world than a half truth. Because you don't know which way to do. You don't know what to do with it. You see, when you look at Nietzsche and you look at Evola and you look at Simic and all of these other ancient authors, you look at them and, and they have this, they've applied that keen and penetrating intellect at the woes of their society of that day and age. And yet I don't see ever the people that read those books figure out how to enjoy any modicum of success other than knowing the truth. Do you see those individuals building success out of that? Or are they simply characters in history that thought of a different way but couldn't make it do anything for anyone? Why are there not great schools of followers of these people that read these books? Because all it is is a well-worded bitch session about their time. And we're in danger of buying into that as Hoder buys into Baldur's lie. It's kind of a half-truth. What great reward. He tells him that it would be a worshipful thing. This is how he convinces him to take a shot at this light of the world. It'll be a worshipful thing. But he lies to him about the equipment he's going to use. Hoder took mistletoe and shot at Baldur. Being guided by Loki, the shaft flew through Baldur and he fell dead to the earth. And that was the greatest mischance that has ever befallen among gods and men. <laughs> to stand at the edge of the crowd, to believe the half-truths, to believe those ideas that if I do this, it'll be worshipful, and to steal the light of the world from men and gods. And there's a number of people in this, in this whole idea that are attempting to do that very thing. They will challenge you, they will make fun of you, they will ridicule, denigrate everything of who you think you are because you haven't listened to the old words that they think are most valuable. They will say that you're not good enough. They will say, well, you don't really even fit in here because, well, you don't really understand. But if you listen to me, I'll give you some ammunition and we'll take a shot at it. But that shot is not helping us raise a sun over everything we're trying to build here. Then when Balder was fallen, words failed all. See, all of the things that we're trying to do here, all of the faith, spirituality, all of the things we're trying to do here, we keep getting pulled to the left or to the right with some kind of ancient Aryan idea or some kind of universalist idea about hate or some other kind of nonsense or, or, the, or even the deeds of our ancestors, as if they might, our understanding and knowledge of them might make us something more because we're buying into a half-truth instead of being encouraged to go and build and do and become something of our own accord, to use the tools that we see gifted to us by Odin, Vili, and Vey, to use the gifts we see cultivated at, at large and at length through the Riggs Thule to to ignore the encouragements that we see that Freya gives to Otter. We buy into all of that half-truth and call it our identity. Not a bit of that will matter the next time a volcano goes off or a comet strikes the earth or you lose a mother or a father or you lose a child. So what kind of half-truth are we supposed to believe here? Are we paying attention to this very serious warning that's being given to us in this ancient text? Sure, it was penned 2,000 years ago, but this is an oral tradition that goes back much, much, much further. The words failed them all. And we will all come to a crossroads in life with what we're dealing with. It may be something as simple as a divorce and now the challenge of raising our own children. How will knowing any of the things these individuals tell us we need to know about Aryan tradition or universalist ideas of hate help us cultivate a child 
that's going to be a beneficial member of the society we want to build. I will direct, and their hands likewise to lay hold of them. Each looked at the other, and all were of one mind as to him who had wrought the work, but none might take vengeance, so great a sanctuary was in that place. But when the Aesir tried to speak, then it befell first that weeping broke out, so that none might speak to the others with words concerning his grief. But Odin bore that misfortune by so much the worst, as he had most perception of how great harm and loss for the Aesir were in the death of Balder. When you have a tribe and you lose the greatest and best of who and what you are, when you lose that individual who is to be your champion, your guiding, who gives the most sound judgments, whose glittering hall shines with gold, where people might go and get a, a righteous, just favor of the legal system, such as the all thing of, that, of Asgard, where do you go from there? And when we listen to those kind of outside ideals, we are robbing ourselves of the opportunity to cultivate our ability to understand what that just system is. Now, when the gods had come to themselves, Frigg spake and asked who there might be among the Aesir who would fain for, have for his own all her love and favor. Let him ride the road to hell and seek if he may find Balder and offer hell a ransom if she will let Balder come home to Asgard. That's going to be a whole nother story. The journey into the afterlife is one of the things which was taken to us. The vilific, when you go in to steal the faith from a, from a group of people, you can do so by force, but it's going to be very hard to stamp that out until you vilify what their afterlife looks like, until you vilify um, the promises of what this faith might offer to individuals living with and of the land. When you begin to steal those things, the first thing you want to do is cast doubt on what's going to happen to you after you die, that great unknown, that great mystery, to put a shadow over the face of the woman, the sun-facing goddess, at the entrance to the, the burial mount. And that's what comes up next, and we'll discuss that at length. <laughs> but with regards to Loki, being the uninspired human intellect, or as a representation of the Pope, the next thing you're going to do after you steal from them or cast doubt upon what might happen to you after you die, well, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to humanize the divine. You're going to bring down to earth that understanding of everything that was considered holy, how the world, how the flows of energy moved across the world, that understanding of the language of the birds, that understanding of poetry, of love, of strength, of courage, those representations that that these gods stood for in all of our lives. Every aspect of each one sat and feasted in the thoughts at the table of our minds, of our faith. When we begin to cast doubt on that, how would you do that? Why, well, you'd send an arrogant, egotistical individual to go in there and denigrate everything about them. After you've stolen the sun from the world, let's steal from them the reasons for their faith. So we have the uninspired human intellect. Well, I can do on my own. I really know the truth. I've got an understanding of the heathen worldview and how it's supposed to this and that and the other. <laughs> or you can humanize the divine to where the people might not ever hold it holy. And we have a real problem with that in Austria today. When is the last time you've seen someone talk about the divine as if they are holy? I saw someone today talking about Odin being an oath breaker and a kinslayer. Oh, how so? Who are we to say that? We're humans. <laughs> now the feast, Eager's Feast, is an interesting thing. Eager, who was also called Gimir, had prepared ale for the gods, and I talked about that earlier. After he got the mighty kettle, as has now been told, to this feast came Odin and Frigg, his wife. Thor came not as he was on a journey in the east. And I, there's something about Thor journeying to the east that uh, captures my imagination like few things do. And one of these days I'll figure it out. Sif, Thor's wife, was there and Brag with Ivan, his wife. Tyr, who had but one hand, was there. The wolf Fenrir had bitten off his other hand when they had bound him. Tyr had, that, had made that sacrifice 
of his ability as a warrior to step into the next stage of his existence as the sage. He had made that sacrifice to protect his, his group of people. And that's a good tale we'll talk about later on too. There were Neorth and Skadi, his wife, Frey and Freya, and Vithar, the son of Odin. Loki was there and Frey. Frey. Servants, Big, Big Vir and Bela. Many were there of the gods and elves, elves. So we have gods and elves and this great feast under the sea, this, the sea being water, this representation of that, that conduit of spiritual energy, that most effective conduit of spiritual energy that we feel the flows of life. When you put your hand on a tree, you can feel something. We may not understand ever what that is, but water is usually the representation of, of the flow of spiritual energy, breath, of life is also um, usually talked about that, the movement of air, but the liquid water, the baptism of a child, um, the sprinkling of water on a child's head under a Thor's hammer, the very ancient pagan tradition. <laughs> there's a, it's a conduit. It's a, it's an ability for the divine to put energy and blessing into the child. And the conduit is always water. The conduit for life itself is water. So all of these gods and elves are feasting in the sea, this abundant realm. It's every bit as abundant as the world we live in, fish, and seaweed, and everything. <coughs> Eager had two serving men, Femifang and Eldir. Glaring gold they had in place of firelight. The ale came in of itself, and great was the peace. So in this wonderful realm of spirit, surrounded by positive spiritual energy of gods and elves and flowing meads. Um, it was a great time of peace and it was a golden place. It, the light shone off the gold of the building itself. So there's, we're looking at a good, peaceful, healthy setting here of men and elves and gods that kind of work together. They're comfortable in who they are. They know who they are. They're not, they're not full of doubt. They've made their achievements, and some of which were mentioned in the introduction. The guests praised much the ability of eager serving man. Loki might not endure that any slew, Femifang. So here, one more time. We have an individual who has stepped out and gone above, this time of his own accord, to do good at what he's, what he's tasked with, to handle the task at hand to do the very best he can with what's in front of him. And I think we forget that a lot of our success in this world always resides in our ability to do the best we can with what's in front of us. And if we don't like what's in front of us, change it. Our thought process determines our reality. If we don't like what we're doing, go do something else. We live in a world where that is possible. <laughs> But this uninspired human intellect, this egotistical individual, this representation of the Pope, we don't need people being successful of their own accord. For the Pope, everything good, everything good about the individual with regards to Christianity must originate outside the individual. You've got to get rid of that. So we cast doubt on our ability to be successful of our own accord. And the second thing is, with the uninspired human intellect, the mind, Loki is going to kill him. I can't, well, that guy's doing better than me, but uh, you know what? They're the last thing I'm going to try to do is measure up to that. I ain't putting any hard work. I'll just kill him. I'll eliminate the competition. So on two different levels, this works very well. Then the gods shook their shields and howled at Loki and drove him away into the forest. And thereafter, set to drinking again, Loki turned back. So they run him off. They didn't kill him. They said, get out of here. We don't need that negative influence. Our own thought process is the same way. Every day we think, I don't know how many thousands of thoughts, but throughout the course of our day, there will be one negative thought that shows up in our mind and how we deal with it will determine the quality of the rest of our day. Are we gonna sit there and stew on something negative or painful? that happened to us? Are we going to cultivate that idea of being a victim? Are we going to cultivate that idea of being angry because, well, they shouldn't have done that to me and I blah, 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 blah. Or are we going to act as the divine does here and run that negative thought out of our mind? 
because that's what we need to be cultivating. That's what we need to be figuring out. If you have those negative thoughts, and they'll run through your mind a dozen times in a day, especially if you're in pain. These are our thoughts. This is our mind. If we can't control the thoughts we think, who can? Might we try to do it pharmacologically? It's always that possibility. I don't have any great objection to people going on those spirit kind of trips, but for the most part, in your average day-to-day -day world, we can't stay screwed up all the time. We can't stay drunk. There's a whole world of problems that go with that. And more often than not, the uninspired human intellect, the ego that's out of control, usually comes from an individual who's never figured out how to, how to stop that thought process. So they drink to cover it up. <laughs> Once again, this idea of how we're supposed to develop in this world originates right here in this ancient lore. But that thought always comes back. We may not get rid of that regret or pain all the time. It's going to show back up. It's going to show back up and start challenging our beliefs about how we think we're good. That negative, it might take everything we can do to get out of bed some morning and stop that negative thinking that that pessimistic idea about today is going to suck. I mean, mostly you see it on Mondays across the world. People don't want to get out of bed. This is going to, this is Monday. Once again, it's your thought. You got to stop it. But the second time it comes back in after screwing up your 30 minutes or whatever it takes for you to get your wits about yourself again, it comes back. Now it's going to challenge everything you think about yourself as positive. As a representation of the Pope, it's going to challenge everything we feel might be considered divine and try to rob our gods of the, of the divinity of who they are. The uninspired human intellect is going to try to ruin our ability to think positively about our chosen faith. At this point, most people will indulge in the kind of righteous indignation based on what they think they know and use those qualifications to determine if someone else is worthy and also true, if they're folks enough, if they know what they're talking about. They're going to find some ancient idea about Aryan pride and being a victim in today's world and or some kind of idea, well, these people hate, so I'm going to hate them and tie up their thought process. Instead of understanding how to develop and deepen their faith, they will begin their trolling ideas of righteous indignation. Speak now, El dear, for not one step further shalt thou fare. What ale talk there here do they have within the sons of the glorious gods? Of their weapons they talk and their might in war, the sons of the glorious gods from the gods and elves who are gathered here, no friend in words shalt thou find. They're having a good time. We're thinking pretty good about ourselves. We're going through the day, one foot in front of the other, might even have a smile on our face. We think, man, I did a good job. I'm doing good here. In the back of our mind, there's something negative. We've been taught how to do that. As things are going along well. When's the other shoe going to drop? Oh, I just knew that was going to go bad. If our parents were the kind of individual that always expected the other shoe to drop, I knew that was going to happen. That's how we're going to be. And we have to unprogram ourselves to stop doing that. This faith is here to help us stop doing that. And every time I turn around, I see some jackass come in here with some idea of righteous indignation that wants to cultivate that. Instead of trying to focus on us being positive and strong and who we are and stand up straight and for us to accomplish something instead of riding on the coattails of our ancestors or some ancient academics book, We're seeing Loki in full effect there in our own thought process. When we start thinking good about ourselves, there's always that idea. Well, what do I have to think good about myself? I didn't do this right. I didn't do that right. I messed that up. I messed this up. There's not really any forgiveness in Austin. There's not really any of that idea that, well, something out there is going to make everything in here okay. It is our responsibility. This is a set of instructions as to how to do that. We must be aware of that negative thought process when it begins to start in the back of our mind and run it off. 
In shall I go into Eager's Hall, for the feast I fain would see. Bale and hatred I bring to the gods, and their mead with venom I mix. Just like every negative thought about ourselves. As soon as it gets in the back door, it starts corrupting every positive good thing we believe about ourselves. And since we haven't figured out how to deal with it, we begin to build righteous indignation and ego as a pale, hateful, ugly, poisonous substitute for the ability to be positive about who we are. Eldir spake, if in thou goest to Eager's Hall, and fain the feast would see with slander and spite would sprinkle the gods, think well, lest they wipe it on thee. And this is what we need to be expecting. You know, if we're going to sit here and try to cultivate a feasting table in our own minds where the gods might be comfortable to feast, we need to understand that if we bring that negative stuff in there, it's going to cause an issue. When you start slinging that shit at everybody, you're going to get some on yourself. Same thing with our thought process. Loki spake, bethink the elder, if thou and I shall strive with spiteful speech, richer I grow in ready words, if thou speakest too much to me. And right there we become afraid. We start trying to think about how positive we are. It seems like the harder we do it, the stronger the conditioning we've undergone in life is going to become to deny us our ability to begin to think positively about ourselves. We're sitting here struggling with these ideas, people in depression and anxiety and all of these other thought processes that literally cripple their ability to properly function in the world. This is a tale right here to help us fix that. We are afraid of our own thoughts. We live in an insane state of mind sometimes because we were conditioned to do that. Well, my mom, my, our fathers are not conferring upon us masculinity and the mothers are not conferring femininity upon their daughters. What solid ground do they have to stand upon to not be afraid of these negative thoughts growing richer in words to denigrate who we are? How are we not going to reach out to something out there to make us feel better about ourselves? Our thought process was attacked right then and there, and we were convinced that something out there would make us feel better in here. Then Loki went into the hall, but when they who were there, they saw who had entered, they were all silent. Many times our thoughts dry up. We fail to be able to come up with some cognizant response to stop the thought process that might cripple the rest of our day. We fail to stop the idea that Man, I gotta have some help. Somebody's gonna have to come in here and give me a hand. I don't know if I can do this. And yet if we look back through our lives, we have a 100% success ratio in dealing with all of those tough times. 100% because we're still here. And it might've been some of the most painful, heinous, ugly things that we could cultivate a victim mentality for for the rest of our lives that we might be able to use to get, garner attention and sympathy from everyone we meet. I saw a woman just before Yule at the Dollar General. She walked in and saw another woman she recognized. And the woman that she recognized said, hi, how are you doing today? The woman didn't say, hi, hello, screw you, nothing. She said, my husband died a couple of days ago. And immediately an outpouring of sympathy and more attention than she probably deserved was heaped upon her. She was cultivating ideas that something out there was going to make her feel better about herself because she could not do it. Loki spake, thirsty I come into this thine hall. I loped from the long journey to ask of the gods that one should give fair mead for a drink to me. Why sit ye silent, swollen with pride, ye gods, and no answer give? Where is the answer when these negative thoughts appear in our minds? What is the positive idea that we cultivate about who we are? Well, it's very difficult to do when we're trying to ride on the coattails of something great our ancestors did, and we haven't done anything great ourselves. We haven't done something magnificent. We haven't done anything worthy of remark that our great-grandchildren might remember and talk about but we have read that book. We do have a little righteous indignation. We can get rightfully indignant and make fun of someone else because, well, they don't necessarily buy into my fantasy. So I'm going to uh, take a shot at them. I'm going to slander them down on social media. 
I'm going to make fun of them because they don't really understand what uh, I'm talking about, which is more important than what you're talking about. So see what's going on here. Why sit ye silent, swollen with pride, ye gods, and no answer give? At your feast of place and a seat prepare me or bid me forth to fare. So you're either going to make me welcome or you're going to run me off. There's a challenge to our hospitality right there. Can we deal with that negative thoughts on its own terms? Can we get it in its proper perspective? Can we stand on our own two feet and take a look at that negative thought, that idea that is harming us on a daily basis and say, you know what? You're not welcome here. And I don't need to show you hospitality. I know who I am and I know what I've achieved. And if nothing else, I stood up and invited these gods back into my home so I might have a shot at becoming something greater. Braggy spoke. A place and a seat will the gods prepare. No more in their midst for thee. For the gods know well what men they wish to find at their mighty feasts. Right there, that great bard himself says no. You're not welcome here anymore. Loki spake, remember, O oh, then in olden days, that we both our blood have mixed. Then didst thou promise no ale to pour, and let's see were brought for us both. So sometime in the past, a half-truth was uttered. A door, a back door was left open. And when you find people that try to get into recovery and try to sober up, that's one of the things they do. Quit leaving yourself that one thing that will allow you to get right back into that negative sneak and thinking process that cripples us from becoming something more. And here's an example of it. The great bard said, no, you're not welcome here. But somewhere along the way, we failed to deal with all the wreckage of our past. Somewhere along the way, we failed to deal with the pain caused to us by our mother or our father or our exes or, our, or anything. One thing. Because our bodies don't know that what our mind is thinking isn't really happening. And as soon as we begin to think about it, our bodies begin to react as if it is truly occurring right then and there. And there's a flood of chemicals that operates through our bodies and we begin to feel it. I've seen men get so mad they couldn't see straight over something that wasn't even happening. They were literally getting high on the flood of chemicals into their body and they don't know how to deal with it. And as soon as it's over, you know what they're asking for? Something out there to make them stop thinking the way they're thinking. Not understanding for a second that they have control of their own thoughts. Not understanding for a second that if they don't act that way, it's okay not to be mad and that they're not going to be less of anything because they didn't react the way they were trained to do. Stand forth in Vithar and let the wolf's father find a seat at our feast. Lest evil should Loki speak aloud here within Eager's Hall. So Odin gives in. Then Vithar arose and poured a drink for Loki, but before he drank, he spoke to the gods. So two of the strongest gods that are present at that time, um, there's kind of an intimidating aspect here. You're going to come in here, but Odin, the king of Asgard, is going to said, all right, Vithar, the one that avenges his death, the heavy shoe, the second strongest of Asgard, pours him a drink. It's kind of like going into a biker bar and you sit down and nobody likes the geek or the millennial that shows up there and the two baddest dudes in the joint say, yeah, come on over here. See, see if you got what it takes. <laughs> hail to you gods, ye goddesses, hail. Hail to the holy throng. Save for the god who yonder sits braggy there on the bench. So he gives him a little bit and he takes it away. He gives him a half truth. Braggy spake, a horse and a sword for my hoard will I give, and a ring gives Braggy to boot. That hatred thou makes not among the gods, so rouse not the great ones to wrath. He offers him a chance. Don't, uh, don't do this, man. It's going to cause you pain. And we do the same thing to ourselves. We know full well that when we start thinking about something that happened to us in our childhood or some wrong or some, you know, you know, when a, when a parent's pass or something along, we know full well when we start thinking about that, it's going to hurt. But Braggy, that great bard, says, don't do it, man. Don't do it. Stay positive in who you are. Begin to think those good thoughts. Don't run off the divine from your life with your own thought process. Loki spake, in horses and rings, thou shalt never be rich. It's kind of an idea about Fehu, that mobile wealth, the cattle, the money on the hoof. 
braggy, but both shalt thou lack. Of the gods and elves here together met, least brave in battle thou art, and shyest thou art of the shot. That's not his role. He's trying to compare him to something that he's not. Braggy composes the songs and the bard and gives all of these wonderful poems and posy. He's not a warrior. So in another half-truth, Loki creates and casts doubt upon the divinity of this being who sits among a throng of gods and goddesses who are all known to be warriors and battle valiantly. But what he doesn't recognize is that they all battle valiantly to become what they're supposed to become. And Braggy does the same thing in his own way. His way may not necessarily be that way. Doubt is cast upon the divinity of that who would spin the words that encourage us, that inspire us, that warm our hearts, and challenge us to go further in life and believe in ourselves. Braggy spake, now were I without as I am within, and here in Eager's Hall, thine head would I bear in my hands away, and pay thee the price of thy lies. Loki spake, in thy seat art thou bold, not so are thy deeds, Braggy, adorner of benches. That's what he does. He sits there and he sings the songs that inspire the, commu the, the tribe, that inspires the fire in the hearts of warriors. Go out and fight if angered thou feelest. No hero such forethought thou hast. That right there is the big old dig. That was one of those venomous comments. So the doubt is cast upon the ability of the bard to inspire the warrior because he's trying to call him a warrior. He's not a warrior. He's the inspirer. I then spake. This is her husband. So now... A divine feminine comes to the defense of the divine masculine. Well, prithee, Braggy, his kinship way, since chosen as wish son he was. The wish son is the adopted son of, of Odin. So when the wish son was the son that, that uh, somebody in the community, I wish he was my son, well, they called him a wish son, and they adopted him. He worked on the farm, and he raised him. And speak not to Loki such words of spite here within Eager's Hall. <laughs> I guess I got that backwards. The wish son in this one is Loki. So it is not his blood. He's talking about Loki being the wish son of Odin, not the brother of Odin. As many people like to say, he is the wish son. He was Laufey's son and Odin chose him as his own for whatever reason. So his wife is telling him, look, don't mince words with a fool. Loki says, be silent, Ivan. Thou art, I say, of women most lustful in love. Since since thou thy washed bright arms didst wine about thy brother's slayer. So this is the part where, you know, Loki trades off um, Iden to Skadi's father. So he sends her over there to be the trophy wife. And we'll talk about that. This is where we get Skadi. I then spake to Loki, I speak not with spiteful words here in Eager's Hall. And Braggy, I calm who is hot with beer, for I wish not that fierce they should fight. She knows it's going to go down. So she tries to calm it down. She's doing her best to protect that which she loves in the feminine way. Now Gephian comes in. Gephian is this goddess who has a, who has a heaven of her own for virgins. Gephian is the one that came down and started the entireness of the Gilfanagony. She is the one that she also brings an aspect of the divine into the bloodline of humanity because she marries a king as well, and her offspring start kingdoms of their own. Why ye gods twain with bitter tongues raise hate among us here? Loki is famed for his mockery foul, and the dwellers in heaven he hates. She points out the common sense. Look, this guy's a jackass. Why are you wasting words missing with me? He says, and I have them all. Don't waste words with a fool. Loki spake, be silent, Gephian, for now shall I say, who led thee to evil life? The boy so fair gave a necklace bright, and about him thy leg was laid. And that's King Gilfi. She, for in the one night's entertainment, she got half of Zealand with those four oxen. <laughs> he's making fun of her. There was a reason for her to be there. So he's cast doubt on Bragi, on Iden, Iduna, on Gephian. He is whittling away at those ideas of divinity that that we have that have been held dear. So as an aspect of the Pope, there's a he's casting doubt upon all of that. And on an aspect of our thought process, it's questioning us. Are we thinking about this right? Are we trying to compare apples to oranges? Are we trying to let some other aspect of our being, are we letting someone else try to fight our battles? How are we controlling this thought process of our own? 
when we know full well that this is a fool's gambit and yet we do it every day. It's our own thoughts, we control them. So there's two aspects going on there. Oh, then spake, mad art thou Loki and little of wit, the wrath of Gephion to rouse for the fate that is set for all she sees, even as I me thinks. So Gephion is no slouch. She is a goddess that has an immense responsibility with regards to ensuring that the feminine, that the divine feminine remains divine. And so much so that Odin looked and said, stop what you're doing, but fooling with the divine feminine. Loki spake, be silent, Odin, not justly thou saidest the fate of the fight among men. He chooses favorites. Off thou gavest thou to him who deserved not the gift to the base or the battle's prize. Well, that's Loki's opinion. It's like watching any fight and saying, oh, the refs made a bad call. That's like watching the football game. Oh, that was a bad call. That should have been a touchdown. It's a half truth. Should we have gone that way or should we have gone this way? What would our choices be? And that's what we've got to be looking at as well. Is our ego telling us, oh, you made the wrong choice. You're going to pay for that now. Well, could have, should have, would have. Oh, then spake, though I gave to him who deserved not the gift to the base of the battle's prize, winter's eight wast thou under the earth, milking the cows as a maid. I and babes did thou spare. Unmanly thy soul must seem. Odin calls it right out right there. You see, in the footnotes here, it says, there is no other reference to Loking having spent eight years underground or to his cow milking. On one occasion, however, he did bear offspring, a giant. So we know we're about building the walls and he gave birth to... Sleipnir. But there was another time too. So this individual who is supposed to be masculine routinely crosses this line. He dresses up as a woman. He changes who he is to create chaos and sow diffusion to stab the gods in the back. This great deceiver, backbiter of the gods, he will become something else. He will sacrifice who he is and pose as something else so he might cause a problem. We need to be aware of individuals that do that. Are they going to act like this? Are they going to act like that? When are we going to stand on our own two feet and be who we're supposed to become? Loki spake, they say that with spells in Sam, Sammy, once like witches with charms didst thou work, and in witches guised among men didst thou go. Unmanly thy soul must seem. So he's challenging him right there with another half-truth. This is when Odin wandered the earth. This is when Odin sacrificed himself on the tree. Someone released him from that tree. Someone released him from that tree after he heard the songs of his ancestors. And at the base of that true shri tree shrieking, he picked up the runes. The very basis for the work of charms. <laughs> so that sacrifice of Odin to himself, where he shed those ideas that were poisoning his own thoughts, that were creating him to irrationally jump off the the, the edge of the whatever and become angry. He got rid of that. And in ridding himself of the poisonous thought process, he heard the song of his ancestors and he learned the language of the runes. There's something very powerful. We need that. He stepped beyond what the thought process of Loki represents. He worked to maintain his divinity and reclaim his throne in Asgard and here's the church saying, no, you're just a witch. How many old women across continental Europe who understood the use of herbs and plants and medicines in the old ways were burned at the stake because they were a threat to men who considered themselves manly? Frigg spake, of the deeds ye two of old have done, ye should make no speech among men. Whatever ye have done in days gone by, old tales should never be told. Frigg understands and sees all things. She knows every bit as much as Odin. And here she's saying right here, no speech should be made among men. And Loki's doing this in this story. He is making that speech among men. Men cannot understand the interactions of the divine with each other. We are just now beginning to figure out how lightning works, the surface of the sun works, the rotation of our planet, the tides collect solar energy. We're just now figuring that out. 
what makes any of us think we might be able to pass judgment on or truly comprehend how the divine works together? And Frigga calls it just plain and simple. You don't talk about this stuff among men. Men have a long way to go. Men are still very subject to indulging in righteous indignation and ego-boosting ideas to make themselves seem more than they really are. Loki spake, be silent, Frigg, for thou art Yorn's wife, but ever lustful in love. For Vili and Ve, thou wife of Vithria, both in thy bosom have lain. So he calls this wife of Odin a whore. Vili and Ve and Odin, these brothers that gave uh, mankind the gifts, he says, you've lain in love with them. Lustful. How would he understand the interaction of that family? How would we understand the interaction of those four divine beings? There's something very special and very powerful that's only hinted at here. But instead of trying to get that understanding of Oath and Vili and Ve and Frigg, we're getting a denigrated view that casts doubt upon the divinity and the interaction of the divine with this very powerful image of the divine feminine. Frigg spake, if a sun like Balder were by me now, here within Eager's Hall, from the sons of gods thou shouldst go not forth till thy fierceness and fight were tried. So she pointed out, look here, I gave birth to a son who was ten times what you were. As a mother, she calls it out and says, you, you, uh, you ain't qualified to carry Walt Balder's water bucket. Most of the people I see running their mouths online, I have that kind of ego that I like to think, you know, really aren't qualified to carry my water bucket when it comes to this kind of stuff. She's casting doubt. She's trying to do that thing to help stop that negative thought process that keeps us paralyzed from becoming something more in this world. This great divine feminine. And if you remember, it is when Sigurd cuts free the Bernie that confines Brunhild and allows her to express the beauty of who she was, this is when he begins to learn the runes. It's a divine feminine, that complemented competing force that creates an individual well-balanced and truly rounded in thought process, emotional state, and mental capacity to become something more. And Loki's trying to cast doubt on that, saying, oh, no, that was just some lust. She's just loose and easy and blah, blah, blah. So there's some real depth here that we need to read between the lines on. Thou wilt then, Frigga, that further I tell of the ill that now I know. Mine is the blame that Balder no more thou seest ride home to the hall. So he just tells him, yeah, he may have been all that, but I went ahead and killed him. Freya spake, mad thou art thou, Loki, that known thou makest the wrong and shame thou hast wrought. The fate of all does Frigg know well, though herself she says it not. So in the defense of Frigga, in the defense of the pain of the mother, you have this goddess of the lover step in to protect her future. Every woman that dares to love hopes to become a mother. Every woman that expresses the beauty of who she is might have that joy sometime of holding a beautiful child. And when the uninspired human intellect threatens the future of a strong, safe, secure motherhood, it is the lover that comes in to say, whoa, buddy, who do you think you're fooling with? Because it's always the crone, the mother, the, the wise woman, the grandmother that understands what her children are going through. And this guy, this uninspired human intellect in an attempt to cast doubt on the divinity of this feminine, this great lover, this mother of two beautiful daughters herself, says, you're going to stop right now, buddy. But Loki ain't smart enough to do that. The uninspired human intellect very rarely has the ability to shut itself off. It, if it cannot boost its ego, it will begin to cultivate a victim mentality. Loki spake, be silent, Freya, for fully I know thee, sinless thou art not thyself. Of the gods and elves who are gathered here, each one as thy lover has slain. Well, of course, 
Love should touch the heart of every individual. If there's nothing else our faith can provide to us, it is that feeling in our hearts that we have some kind of love and affection for those people we choose to call our kin and our kindred, our families. Her love has touched the hearts of everyone there. And the only thing the uninspired human intellect can see is, oh, you kind of fooling around over there, huh? That right there is your very clear indication that he does not understand the interaction of the divine with each other, must, much less with the interaction with men that praise them. <laughs> Freya spake, false is thy tongue, and soon shalt thou find that it sings thee an evil song. The gods are wroth, and the goddess is all, and in grief shalt thou homeward go. Loki spake, Be silent, Freya, thou foulest witch, and steeped full sore in sin, in the arms of thy brother the bright gods call thee, when Freya her wind is set free. So she's, he's calling, once again, one of the most powerful things, one of the most powerful stories is when Frey falls head over heels for Gerder. It is the aspect of a goddess that inspires love, that would most touch her brother's heart to love Gerder and to sacrifice that very powerful phallic symbol of the young warrior to become the husband and the lover in his own home. Yeah, she inspired him. Yeah, she touched his heart. But that's not what the uninspired human intellect sees. He can't comprehend what that might really mean because he doesn't have the ability to stop his thoughts from doing anything other than thinking about how great he is based on the thinking alone. Neorth spake, small ill does it work, though a woman may have a lord or a lover or both. But a wonder it is that this womanish God comes hither, though babes he is born. So Fred's dad steps in and says, huh, and gives him a good one here. I mean, small ill does it work, though a woman may have a lord or a lover or both. If that woman is has a lord or a lover or both, it's probably not an uncommon thing when men disappeared for three or four or five years to go fight a war. You know, we all look at our heritage and we say, well, my, my, uh, my heritage goes all the way back to the king, king of the Franks at Cologne, which mine does. But who's to say that the uh, stable boy wasn't getting a little bit of that too? You know what I mean? Because women are women and they have their own needs. It was Christianity that vilified that. And as the representation of the Pope, here he is vilifying this ability of women to love. And the Lord calls him on it, that God of the sea and of abundance, that, <laughs> that father of the abundance and love and fertility of the earth that comes from the sea. Loki spake, be silent, North. Thou wast eastward sent to the gods as a hostage given, and the daughters of Hymir their privy had. When used did they make of thy mouth? The daughters of Hymir, those are the waves. Those are the mothers of Heimdall. So he's trying to throw something, once again, this un misunderstanding of the interaction of the divine. This God of the sea is going to know those daughters very well. And they're going to pour into the sea at the mouths of the rivers that, that Scotty represents from her snow-capped peaks. And it, and it melts and runs down the rivers into the sea in about a six-month cycle. And then it evaporates and goes in the clouds and goes back up into the mountains and snows. There's your, there's a, a, a story there that simple explanation of the of the cycle of water in the world north spake great was my gain though long was i gone to the gods as a hostage given the son did i have whom no man hates the foremost of gods is found so he's speaking of Frey now he's like so Frey also has a god as a son that's that rivals balder Frey is this wonderful lord of alfheim that loves, that gives us this demonstration on a divine level of what it means to love a woman, what you must sacrifice to be that partner. And great was his gain, though long he was gone. So he's not a hostage there at this point. He is a part of the Aesir. He is a part of that tribe. That was a creation by Odin that balanced out the high-minded sky god mental aspects of the Aesir with the very warm, powerful, abundance gods of the Vanir. He created a well-rounded tribe that was strong in every aspect of what it was. There was love and abundance and strength and thought, all of these wonderful things. And Njord was a part of that. Loki spake, 
Give heed now to your nor bodes too high. No longer I hold it hid. With thy sister hadst thou so fair a son, thou hadst, thus hadst thou no worse a hope. So your sister is your, Thor's mother. So the sea and the earth gave birth to that God that offers gentle rains to the crops. Once again, another cycle. The Lord is pivotal in all of those cycles of abundance that govern our, that govern our realm. Our ability to eat resides heavily on the ability of these good rains, our ability to fish, our ability to harvest the fish and the crops and all of these things. Njord's a part of that. And all great and good things come from Njord, the warder of men and the men and the God that creates abundance and blessings for men. They come from the earth. They are not because we think about them. They appear because our thought processes allow us to do the best we can with what's in front of us and generate for ourselves that abundance that we, that we, so, that we seek. Tear spake. Of the heroes brave is Frey the best, here in the home of the gods. He harms not maids nor the wives of women, and the bound from the fetters he frees. So that Frey is the best of heroes. And if you'll remember, at the end of all things, Frey is the one that stands there with an antler of an elk to fight search. He has given up that powerful symbol that was so wonderful it fought of its own accord and he won every battle. He was great in battle. He was no joke. This God of abundance, fertility, strength, and that powerful representation of what a man should become when he decides to love a woman. He's still a powerful warrior. He knows all of those things, but he's not so insecure in who he is that he can't set that aside and really become a partner to the woman that he loves. It's a beautiful thing to think about. And this God tier that sacrificed a hand for the safety of his community takes up his defense. And if you'll notice, each of these different gods are stepping up to the plate to defend the other. They're not just leaving them out there waving in the wind on their own when somebody's talking bad about them. They're stepping up to the plate saying, hey, wait a minute, you're not understanding what's going on here. They're stepping up to the defense of those individuals that step up to the plate to inspire others to want to become more. Loki spake, be silent here, for between two men, friendship thou never couldst fashion. Fain would I tell how Fenry wants thy right hand rent from thee. So this great God of, of war that he calls him, you never, and it says it in the Lord. This is a God of war. This is a God of combat. That is his role. He's not supposed to be out there giving warm dad hugs on the side of the, of the LGBTQ parade. He's out there to go out there and inspire these men to get in a wedge formation and lay the holy smack down on, that, on the enemy's butt. He's there for that reason, to protect the tribe. He is built, and he is designed to, to guide men by that Tiwaz, by that guiding northern star, which way to go, how to be successful, and how to make sure that your tribe has what it's supposed to be. You might have to fight to do it. And Loki's the one that gave birth, in that most unmanly of things, to a wolf that bit his hand off. And yet, so... There's a half truth there to try to rob the divinity that guided English princes. Tears spake, my hand do I lack, but profit near thou, and the loss brings longing to both. Ill fares the wolf who shall ever await in fetters the fall of the gods. So that wolf still, he, he tells him right there, he said, he may have bit my hand off, but we're still going, he's going to die at the end of all things. No question about it. Vithar is going to take him, he's going to pull his head apart, pull his head apart. Loki spake, be silent, here, for a son with me thy wife wants chance to win. Not a penny, methinks, wouldst thou pay for the wrong, nor waste right at an inch, poor wretch. Tyr's wife is most commonly referred to as Isa, the continental uh, goddess, at, and, there's, and there's statues and altars of her, the cognizant of Tyr is Isa. She's a goddess that in Augsburg, on September 28th, they made great feast and celebrated uh, a victory against the Roman after they made sacrifice and offering to Zisa. So his wife was every bit as much a, a war goddess. Her symbol is that light uh, ship, that light uh, ship that would sail up the, up the uh, rivers that the Norse used to great effect. So she was a powerful goddess in her own right. Personal favorite of mine, I, I, I think. 
there's no reference anywhere about a son that that Loki and her had a son. Who knows where it was lost? It may maybe it's in two of the lost books of the Codex Regius. Now Frey spake. So Frey sticks up for tear. Frey, by the mouth of the river, the wolf remains till the gods to destruction go. Thou too shalt soon, if thy tongue is not still, to be fettered, thou forger of ill. So Frey tells him, you're about done here, buddy. You've insulted us enough. But the damage is done, isn't it? If Loki is a reference to the Pope by Snorri, doubt is cast upon the divine, the divinity of all these actions. He has brought down to a human level of understanding these great, good, and divine beings that inspired all reverence and were considered holy by hundreds of generations of people before us. All that's been cast into doubt. Now, instead of believing in ourselves, we're being forced to look out there somewhere. And that one that whispers to the, to the blind at the edge of the crowd, the crippled, the, the ones that aren't a part of the community, he's the one doing all of this. Big ear spake. Had I birthed so famous an Ingunar Frey and set in so lofty a seat, I would crush tomorrow this croaker of ale and beat all his body to bits. So Big, Big Veer is one of Frey's two servants, okay? Ingunar Frey, is, it's not a, a, a name that's used elsewhere in the poems or by Snorri. It may be a genitive of a, of a woman's name, Ingun, the unknown sister of Neorth, who was Frey's mother, or a corruption of the name Ingu used for Frey in old German mythology. So we really don't know who Ingenar Frey is, but she's related there some way. But uh, this servant, even the servants of the gods are stepping up saying, wait a minute, you're trying to take something from us that we have held in reverence for so long. And I should crush this. I should stop this. And perhaps we ought to be taking that same stance. Perhaps we need to be standing up and saying, you will not denigrate this divine thing in front of me. And yeah, I see people doing it on social media every day because they really know something. Shut up. Loki spake, what little creature goes crawling there, snuffling and snapping about? And Frey's ears ever wilt thou be found, or muttering hard at the mill. Yes, he's a regular man. He's going to work. He's going to stand up for what he believes to be holy and divine. And he's being insulted because of it. Sometimes we are too. Sometimes we're insulted. Sometimes we're made fun of because something we hold holy is not something that the uninspired human intellect or the church understands. My name, big of ear, my name, and nimble am I, as gods and men do grant. And here I, here I am I proud that the children of hope drink together, all drink ale. So this servant is proud of what he's done, what he's accomplished. He's also proud that all of these gods and goddesses are feasting. Much as we should be, if we set in our mind's eye a feasting table worthy of the gods to join us, of those divine ideas and images, to sit at a table in our mind and feast, because our thoughts are the good, clean, powerful, positive thoughts about who we are, as this servant demonstrates. Loki spake, be silent. Thou never could set their shares of the meat for men. Hid in straw on the floor, they found thee not when heroes were fain to fight. So he calls him a coward. Now the warder, now the, now Heimdall spake, drunk art thou Loki and mad are thy deeds. Why Loki leaveth th thou this not? For drunk beyond measure will lead all men no thought of their tongues to take. So there's a warning right there from Heimdall. <laughs> this son of seven mothers, the whitest of the Asa, this God that represents some of the loftiest ideas about what we might become. He's telling him right there, that thought process that corrupts our mind or that challenges our ability to figure out what we might be good and right and true in action, it's usually when we get drunk, too drunk, then we start running our mouths and talking and we begin to corrupt the influence the divine has in our own world. This is a challenge and Heimdall is the one that points it out, the one that sees all things. Loki spake, be silent, Heimdall, in days long since was an evil fate for thee fixed. With back held stiff must thou ever stand as warder of heaven to watch. So that fate long fixed 
is, he's, is that it's Heimdall who is going to slay the uninspired human intellect. And I don't think it's any accident that it is this warder of the divine that stops the uninspired human intellect at the end of all things. He's the one that puts an end to Loki. Skadi spake, light art thou, Loki, but longer thou mayest not in freedom flourish thy tail. On the rocks the gods bind thee with bowels torn forth from thy frost-cold sun. Now, if you'll remember, when Skadi goes to collect the shield for the killing of her father, Loki's at the heart of all of that. Loki's the one that takes Iduna to Skadi's father, and they, he ra races over there in his eagle plumage. He changes the aspect of who he is from the divine feminine and goes and steals this other divine feminine back who's simply being a trophy wife, brings her back to Asgard, and this is where they kill Skadi's father. Part of the punishment was they had to make, him, make her laugh. So Loki tied a goat to his nuts, and the goat was tugging around, and he was in great pain, and he laughed. So Skadi has already laughed at the masculine aspect of Loki altogether. She's cast doubt on it, this uninspired human intellect. When a woman laughs at a man, it's a dangerous thing. Who knows how that man's going to react? But it will cripple him. One of the things that happens to POWs, one of the ways in which they're trained at the Seer camp at Camp McCall, they will strip you down, wet you down, and they will bring a woman in there, and she will laugh at you. She will cast doubt upon your masculinity. You may be broken, tired, hungry, don't know what's going on, not really sure reading where you're at, missing, not had any sleep. Now all of a sudden there's a woman there laughing at you. Well, you might not really be tough enough to handle this after all. Your mind has to overcome that. So Scalthy has already done this to Loki. And now she's telling him, you're finally going to pay for what you did to my father. <coughs> Loki spake, though on rocks the gods bind me with bowels torn forth from my frost-cold sun, I was first and last at the deadly fight there where the Ozzy were caught. Scalthy spake, Wert thou first and last at the deadly fight where Theology was caught from my dwellings and field shall ever come forth a counsel cold for thee. So he's going to pay forever for what he did to her father. Then Sif came forward and poured mead for Loki in a crystal cup and said, Hail to thee, Loki, and take thou here the crystal cup of old mead. For me at least alone of the gods, blameless thou knowest to be. He took the horn and drank therefrom. Alone thou wert, if truly thou wouldst all men so shyly shun. But one do I know full well, methinks, who had thee from Lorithi's arms, Loki the crafty and lies. So when Loki steals from Sif, this great goddess of the harvest, this kind of representation of Frigg that is the wife of the warder of men, when the warder of men has a wife who is a goddess of the harvest, the uninspired human intellect, the stealing of her hair, that is the, that is the, Theft of the femininity of woman. That is the rape of Sith. And this is what he's talking about. He's already struck hard at the warder of men, the one that protects men, the divine aspect that protects men from these kinds of things. Bala spake, the mountains shake, and surely I think from his home comes Lorithi now. He will silence the man who is slandering here, together both gods and men. Loki spake, be silent, Balin, thou art Bigavir's wife, and deep art thou steeped in sin. A greater shame to the gods came never befouled, thou art with thy filth. And then Thor came forth and spake, unmanly one sees, for the mighty hammer mule near shall close thy mouth. The warder of men comes in here and stops this entire ugly procession of thinking. This thing that casts doubt on all of it. Thy shoulder cliff shall I cleave from thy neck, and so shall thy life be lost. <coughs> Loki spake, Lo, in has come the son of earth. Why threaten so loudly, Thor, lest fierce thou shalt go to fight the wolf when he swallows Sigfather up. Thor doesn't fight him at all, it's Vider. Thor spake, so he threatens Thor with a half-truth to try to create doubt in his abilities. Thor spake, unmanly one cease, or the mighty hammer Mjolnir shall close thy mouth. I shall hurl thee up and out in the east, where men shall see thee no more. Loki spake, that thou hast fared on the east road forth, to men shouldst thou say no more. In the thumb of a glove didst thou hide, thou great one, and there forgot what thou wast Thor. Another half-truth. 
This was a bewitching of magic against which the warder of men had no defense. And though in the end we find out he did and do did indeed do great things. He didn't shy away from the magic. He faced it head on and did great things that troubled the giant, scared him to death. And they had to make him leave and then they disappeared. Thor spake, unmanly one sees for the mighty hammer Mjolnir shall close thy mouth. My right hand shall smite thee with Rungnir slayer till all thy bones are broken. Loki spake, a long time still do I think to live. Though thou threatenest thus with thy hammer, rough seem the straps of Skinnir's wallet, when thy meat thou mightest not get, and faint from hunger didst feel. Thor spake, Unmanly one sees for the mighty hammer of Mjolnir shall close thy mouth. The slayer of Hungnir shall send thee to hell and down to the gate of death. Loki spake, I have said to the gods and the sons of the gods the things that wetted my thoughts. <coughs> but before thee alone do I now go, for thou fightest well, I ween. Well, think about that. He has talked shit to every one of these gods and sons of gods and the servant man too. He has challenged the very idea of how divine they are. He has questioned the interactions of the divine with each other. He has demonstrated ignorance on a grand scale. But it is Thor, the warder of men, that God that is there to protect us, that defense against the dark, the giants, all of those things, that's there to help us strengthen and embolden our thoughts so we might not fall prey to a thought process we've been conditioned to accept and in many cases enjoy. How insane is that, that we might enjoy it? But it is the warder of men that comes in to help us stem that tide, the very idea of courage and strength that lets us get up out of bed when we don't think we can and put one foot in front of the other and go about our day. Ale thou hast brewed, but eager now such feasts shalt thou make no more. So, as we said before, Eager's Feast takes place in the sea, that great conduit of spiritual energy. And Loki says right there, he is going to rob men of the ability to make that connection with the divine and shut off that feasting in the sea. Over all that shall hast, which is here within, shall play the flickering flames, and thy back shall be burnt with fire. Over all that hast which is here within shalt thou play the flickering flames. So there's a threat right there of the Christian Satan as an aspect of the Pope. That is a threat. That is, you will no longer have this, con this connection to the divine. You will no longer be able to feast with the gods. You will no longer have that connection. And if you do, you will be facing the flickering flames. And after that, Loki hid himself in Frenning's waterfall in the guise of a salmon. And there the gods took him. He was bound with the bowels of his son, Valley. So that negative thought process of his father cost the son his life, as many times it does. When the father fails to confer masculinity upon the son, he will go out in the world and try to do the best he can with it. And we watch our sons in pain because we fail to bring them into the world so that they might be men. But his son Narfi was changed to a wolf. Skathi took a poisonous snake and fasted it up over Loki's face. She told him she was going to bring him a cold punishment, and there it is. And the poison dropped there on. Sigyn, Loki's wife, sat there and held a shell under the poison. But when the shell was full, she bore away the poison, and meanwhile the poison dropped on Loki. Then he struggled so hard that the whole earth shook therewith, and now that is called an earthquake. Sigyn, Loki's wife, sat there and held a shell under the poison. So this being, this uninspired human intellect, and this aspect of Christianity, this woman must sacrifice everything she ever thought she was going to be and serve this man who refuses to change his ways. Since she is up, go get me a beer. And she's going to know her place, and it's going to be right there to protect this man from, this, from these rabid ideas of ego that makes him think he's greater than what he really is. And he's going to sit there and he's going to be angry. He's going to come home after work every day and do nothing but bitch about it. And she's going to take care of it. And she's going to know her place. Sound familiar? Because that's what's happening. And here is our ancient lore, thousands of years old, telling us this is what we need to be aware of. 
when you partner with a man who has demands that you sacrifice who you are, even the Muslims, that woman is entirely blacked out from the world. She is literally blacked out and not allowed to be anything more than that. If she talks, she gets beaten, you know, the, and even in, even in a lot of places. So there's a whole idea there that we need to be paying attention to, and it works on many different levels. And that's, that's the end of the Lokasana and the idea of Lok Eager's Feast. And it's almost, as you can tell, it's one of my favorites because it covers so much and it's so in depth and it's so clear to me what it means and how we might use it in today's world. And that's the most crucial thing about all of this lore. You can read all them old radical academics you want. How is that going to help you become something more in this world? I can sit here at armchair quarterback, the football game, the political arena, the religious arena, all I want to. And it does, all it does is help me build a powerful ego and fill me with righteous indignation. It's about who's controlling the world and who runs all the banks and all of this nonsense and armchair quarterback, all of it. And never once sitting there feeling in that righteous indignation and that justification, will I ever need to change a thing? And my partner will sit here and keep the poison from dropping off my face. And I'll be bound by my own failures with my family. That right there is what we need to be aware of. And I see far too many people missing that and then having the audacity to say, well, Brian Wilton's really not an awesome truth. Ah, stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Thanks, guys, for joining me. I appreciate it.